All right, so um, tonight's lecture is on artificial insemination and we're super excited to have Chance Marshall who um, is an the extension educator for the Northwest area. He's housed in Fremont County. And um, if you guys did one of the sessions last year, he helped with that. He's done a couple of, of other labs for us. And so we're super excited. This is kind of, I think his expertise area is artificial insemination. So we're excited to have him on. And with that chance, you can add whatever you'd like to add to that introduction. Okay, thanks, Don. Um, no, I'm uh, I'm happy to I'm happy to be here um, and and talk to you guys about this. This is something I'm pretty passionate about. Um, I within my job, I do a lot of things, but one of the things that I do and and really enjoy doing is uh, I kind of teach a uh, well. I'm in charge of coordinating and teaching a bunch of these cattle at artificial insemination schools that we're doing across the state, and. Um, you know, uh, we help a lot of people uh, throughout the year and, you know, learning the process of AI and why it's important and, and how you do it and why you do it and where to get the equipment that you need and where to buy the semen and all that good stuff. Um, and uh, so I've got, I've got, uh, I got started doing this kind of thing um, just with some of our own cows. We've got our own cow herd um, that we AI every year. Um, just commercial cattle, um, but we do we do have some show cattle, and I grew up showing steers and showing heifers, and and uh, you know I got pretty passionate about uh, this whole AI thing and just what what kind of clubby bulls could I use to to make some good show cattle out of our you know commercial herd, and and uh, just kind of stem from there. And then when I got to college, I started uh, working more on the producer side of things, and and uh, really understanding how we can use um, you know, artificial insemination to make impacts on, you know, making more money as a rancher or uh, making your, you know, your cow herd uh, more productive. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at while I was in school. Um, you know, I was exposed to some uh, pig AI. Uh, I've got a lot of friends that are that are into showing hogs and and been around that a little bit. That's that's super interesting. Um, same type of deal. Maybe I'll get into it more in the future. Uh, my family also has a. Um, uh, they're they're pretty into um, raising uh, rodeo horses and, and barrel horses in particular. So uh, we've got a couple. My my parents have a couple studs and a bunch of brood mares, and they um, you know have quite the breeding operation going on. Uh, so I've been exposed to the the horse side of things quite a bit too, um, but uh, but cattle is really where my expertise are. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about all of them today, but I'm probably going to be a little heavier on the cattle side of stuff because that's really what I know. Um, but I do know the basics of the other things, and I really want to have a, a a good discussion with you guys. So um, I don't want this just to be me talking the whole time. If you guys have questions or something that we can talk about. Um, I think that's good. So can everybody hear me? Anybody, anybody want to volunteer to say they can hear me? Just so we I know. Can hear you. Okay, good. Sounds good. All right. Well, I will go ahead and get started then. Um, so can somebody tell me what, what is artificial insemination? I don't really know um, what all you guys' exposure is to it, but what is the idea of it? Any volunteers? Okay. Well, basically what it is, well, what it is is just, uh, it's just the process of collecting sperm cells from a male animal and manually depositing them into the reproductive tract of a female. So instead of letting the, the bull or boar or ram um, do the breeding, we are actually, um, we're actually gonna do that that we're going to deposit that and, and make that breeding happen, you know, uh, ourselves. And there's, there's some advantages and disadvantages to this whole process, but the, I, the biggest idea of it, I think, is that you can take genetically superior um, traits from um, some of these high quality animals, whether we're, we're talking about show cattle or whether we're talking about um, seed stock Angus or, um, you know, uh, we're trying to produce good quarter horse genetics or, or whatever the case might be with any of the animals that we're doing, um, we can take, instead of 
I, I don't know if you guys have been around and trying to purchase some of these genetically superior sires or whatever breed or whatever uh, species we're talking about, um, but they can be pretty expensive. Um, and it wouldn't be cost effective for us to go out and buy those genetics um, if we were to buy the whole bull or the, you know, the whole boar or whatever it is, but we can still use his genetics by purchasing some semen from him. Um, so it might a, a sire might cost you know fifty thousand um, dollars, and we can't you know it's not it doesn't make sense for us to buy them, but we can buy a straw semen for you know twenty or twenty five bucks, and we can put that in our cow herd and use his genetics. So um, that's probably the biggest reason, um, or biggest biggest reason why people do this, um, and why it is a good tool. Uh, so some of these slides that I have on here are just, you know, from the first class that I teach in my AI and my cattle AI schools. Um, and I've added a few words to them here and there, but basically uh, highly, it's, it's really highly used in the dairy cattle and swine industry. Um, so, you know, with dairy cattle, I don't know if you guys have been around any dairy bulls or anything, but they're not much fun. They're big and they're they got a bad attitude a lot of times. And, and uh, you know, they're just another animal that you gotta feed and manage and maintain the whole year and those dairy operations don't wanna do that. So they've got really, you know, they're, they really maximize their genetic potential and don't have to have those bulls around. So the dairy industry really, really, I think it's 90 something percent of, uh, of females are bred AI via AI in the dairy industry. So it's almost all of them are done that way. Um, and same with, uh, uh, maybe not so much, but uh, really, really high still in swine. Um, but if we look at just the beef industry, um, it's pretty underutilized. Less than 5% of beef females are bred in the U.S. Uh, via AI, and um, only 13% of, oper of operations total are really using this technology. So it's kind of, the, it, it is the beef industry's most underutilized tool. And there's some reasons for that. Um, but uh, it varies. And I think that anytime we're talking about purebred animals, it's gonna be higher um, just because of the, um, you know, if, you're, if you've got a purebred operation, um, you're using, you're trying to produce really a, a specific product um, and you're using those for, for breeding and we're, met, we're trying to use the best genetics we can get a hold of. Whereas maybe with a, uh, you know, um, an operation where we're producing um, meat or just a terminal, you know, steers or, or if they're going to the feedlot or if something like it's just a terminal cross, it's not as, um, not as widely used, but there's still um, really the benefits, no matter what size of producer you are, what your goals are. Um, and considering the costs of natural service, um, there's been a lot of research that's compared the costs of of uh, you know artificial insemination versus just your natural service. Um, so uh, you know artificial insemination. It sounds cheap uh, uh, on the um, you know uh, at first whenever I say it's only twenty or twenty five dollars. But there's also a lot of equipment that goes with it. If you're um, if you're going to be using uh, frozen semen, you're going to need a nitrogen tank. Uh, if uh, you're also going to need a thaw box, you're going to need, you know, uh, you know, a bunch of these, bunch of this equipment. If you're going to be using fresh semen um, to breed your your mare, uh, you're going to have to have a good relationship with a veterinarian, and they're going to, you're going to have to. There's going to be some costs associated with that. Whereas, you know, in that case, it might be cheaper just to throw them out and have, or throw her out and have her life covered by a. Um, uh, a stud, but we may not be able to take advantage of the genetics that way. So um, there's there's a lot of things that go into it, but just from the commercial cattle side of things, just from the you know cow calf producer normal guy in in Wyoming, um, it, it's still pretty expensive on the front end to buy that bull too. So if an average Angus bull um, to to clean up your cows and stuff is probably going to be you know, right around that $5,000 mark. So, and how many, any 
Anybody have any idea how many cows you think one bull can cover in a breeding season? Anybody have any guesses? If we just turned a bull out with a bunch of cows, how many can we expect him to breed? It's actually a lot lower than most people think. Uh, the the answer is, is is about 25 cows, 20 to 25 cows per bull. So um, with that, uh, you're paying that kind of money. Um, you might only be able to retain that bull for a few years, um, and he's only going to breed 20 to 25 a year on average. You know, some are more, some are a little less, but that's the average number. So we're not really getting a whole lot of bang for our buck um, with that, if you know what I mean. Uh, but if we're going to artificially inseminate, we can, you know, we can take one collection from that sire, dilute it a bunch, and you know, collect him every day, and we can breed hundreds or thousands with that sire if we wanted to via AI. Um, so there's costs associated with both, and really, um, I, I think there's a really good argument just from the genetic potential side of things for AI, um, but uh, it doesn't work for everybody, and and not everybody is able to wrap their head around it. But I wanna ask, um, I wanna be a little interactive and ask you guys, why would you AI? I mentioned one, we've talked about genetics, but if you are a rancher or if you are a, um, a livestock owner of any kind, what are some reasons why you would AI? And, and remember that I said that in some industries it's really used a lot and, uh, or some, some species it's really used a lot and some it's not. Um, so there's reasons why you would and why you wouldn't. But I wanna ask why would you AI? What are some reasons why? Um, to be competitive like for show cattle um, okay. or like show lambs, it could help you like jump in, your, get a, jump in your genetics without having to like spend that money on like maybe a really expensive bull yeah. Or you can like get a different variety of semen rather mm -hmm. than just having one. So definitely, definitely that, I think that plays right in with our genetics. Um, so there is that genetic part that um, we can take advantage of um, that we might otherwise not be able to do. Um, so whether that's in the show ring, um, you know, trying to produce a, you know, a really good steer that's going to win the show or a really good, um, you know, Barrow that's going to win the show, that for sure. But also, if you're uh, just a, a, if you're producing steer calves that are going to the feedlot, you make a living as a rancher selling your steers. Um, we can use a sire that has the best genetics in the country for growth so that our calves will weigh a little bit more when we sell them at weaning and we can make more money. Um, so that's another reason why, how we can use genetics. Um, what else? Um, couldn't it like synchronize the birth so they're all within like a week or two? Yes, that's awesome. I love it, that's, that's huge. So there, yep, um, that's, there's a management thing to it. So, so I don't know, when I was in college, I had a job um, during the week. I did it a couple days a week and I was night calving. And, uh, you know, basically I would have to stay up and watch these, uh, watch these cows and make sure that nothing went wrong. And I'd have to pull some calves or have to call the vet out if we had a real mess and he'd have to do a C-section. And it wasn't very much fun, but I was getting paid, it was extra money, I didn't mind. But it seemed like it took forever. It seemed like I never stopped night calving, like every week for the longest time. And I just remember thinking like, why in the world would somebody want a cab this long? Why? I mean, uh, and, and I, just, I just thought, you know, then it, it kind of made sense to me that, you know, an AI program, if we synchronize whenever we breed, synchronize just means that we can manipulate whenever we are gonna breed an animal. Um, and if we can breed them all at the same time, they're gonna calve close to the same time which means that they don't have to pay the college kid to come out and night calf for three months. Does that make sense? And so there is a concentration of labor, but there's also an aspect of, of if I'm going to, if I'm that rancher that's selling steer calves or something like that, 
I can produce a more uniform crop of calves. So I can have a whole bunch of steer calves that are, or heifer calves, whatever I'm producing, that are um, the same age, close to the same weight, they're gonna make a load that's really uniform and I might get a premium when I sell that group of calves. So definitely there is a management advantage to doing it. But we don't necessarily have to AI, we could synchronize and just turn the bulls out and still get the same advantage. But, but we can combine getting that management advantage with our genetic advantage. Anything else? There's quite a few. All right. Well, so improved production traits. This is kind of the genetics part. Um, we can use proven sires with superior genetic progress. There's weaning weight, feed efficiency, or age of puberty in females. It's also really important um, if whenever we're breeding our our heifers or young females, um, we've got a lot invested in those, and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about cattle or sheep or um, whatever whatever animal you're dealing with. Um, your young females represent the best genetics of your of your herd or flock, um, and we've got a lot of money and time and, and effort invested in them, so it doesn't make sense to breed them to a sire that doesn't have a, a low birth weight or calving ease, high accuracy. That just means that like, you, you don't wanna just turn your females in with whatever sire and not really know for sure with confidence that they're not gonna produce big calves um, or, or cause any kind of calving difficulty that, uh, you know, could put your heifer in jeopardy or um, cause issues or anything like that. So we want to use sires that have produced a lot of offspring and, and we can, you know, our, we can be very confident that he's going to produce calving ease births. Just easy calvin births. That way we don't have to pull as many calves. That way um, it's easy for the heifers to have their calves. We want to use low birth weight, high accuracy sires. So that's that's um, one important one. Um, we can redu reduce the number of sires needed. It, sometimes it doesn't make sense to breed every single female um, via AI. So we might still need to use a, uh, a cleanup sire, um, but we can reduce the number of those that are needed. So, you know, for example, if we bred one time a uh, 100, 100 heifers and we got 60 of them pregnant, that leaves 40 that still need to be bred on the second cycle. So instead of, you know, and we've got a, a sire, or we've got a sire can do 25 calves, right? So instead of needing four to cover the 100, we only need two to cover the um the 40. so we can save the cost on buying those bulls or maintaining them throughout the year um just by um you know doing that that round of artificial insemination and we can breed one one more sire more females to one sire so like i was saying if we've got one that really works well in our herd or uh you know we can instead of just breeding 25 females we can we can breed a lot of them and we can really spread his genetics out and take advantage of them that way um, if a sire dies a lot of times um, sires and all i'll talk a little bit about the differences and 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 how freezing semen works um, between the, the different species but most all species you can um, freeze and and whenever you've got a sire that is really prominent and does really well, um, we can freeze his semen and use him at a later date. So after he's dead, we can use him. Um, uh, and, and like cattle, especially, they're really um, tolerant uh, in comparison to other species for freezing. So, I mean, I've got my my father-in-law has semen in his nitrogen tank um, from bulls that have been dead since the late 70s you know it's and we can still use them we don't really 
ever, but they're just kind of cool to see. But but you can you can preserve those for a long period of time. And I know there there's some sires that worked really well. Um, you know, I can think of just you know uh, a lot in the racehorse industry. You've get um, horses that do really really well, and they breed breed a lot of you know you know good good offspring and and we can use that uh, that genetic those genetics later at a later date or like in the cattle or with the show cattle I can think of I mean um, whenever I was growing up whenever I was a little kid heat wave was the 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 thing you know um, and he sired more um, more champions than than any other sire uh, and he still does. Every once in a while, you still still see a heat wave that wins. Um, and there's so many of of his progeny that are out there now that are you know um, doing really well. But but uh, you know he's been dead a long time, and we can still use those genetics. Another thing too is uh, sometimes you've got females that aren't naturally cycling. This can happen for a, you know a variety of reasons. They might be thin. Um, you know, just meaning that they, they haven't got enough feed um, and that they don't have enough fat to, for their body to function right and they're not cycling or maybe they calve to late in the calving season and we're trying to breed her before she's, you know, her body's, you know, back on track and through a synchronization protocol, we can actually induce the cyclicity or make her uh, cycle again and get her pregnant to keep her and track or you know on track and I know with cattle we want to as a goal um, typically we want our females to have a calf every 365 days or one calendar year and if our cows are in very good shape you know we're going through a drought or you know for whatever reason that you know there's not enough feed available or or whatever it is um, you know every year she calves a little bit late and eventually she's going to fall out of the calving cycle and not have a calf. And, um, you know, we've got to make a decision then whether to replace her, um, and, and, you know, replace her with a female that might be more productive or keep her, um, and, and just eat the cost of it. Um, so one of the tools that we can do is just, you know, by using a synchronization protocol or using some kind of um, uh, system to, to get them to cycle when they wouldn't normally cycle um, yet uh, and keep those cows around or keep those females around is important. And like we talked about a little bit before, we can, we can allow for a shorter breeding season and calving seasons and concentrate our labor and calf crop. Okay, so those are the reasons why you would AI. Um, can somebody tell me why people wouldn't AI? Why, why is only 13% of the beef industry using it? Uh, for large herds, it's maybe not cost effective. Okay. All right. What else? The time period used to AI is really restrictive. Okay, so you, what you're meaning like, like it's hard to get uh, maybe enough help to do it, or you know, trying to find a date that works works for everybody. I don't. What do you mean by that? It's really restrictive. Like you have like a certain amount of times when you have to get each shot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can see that. Any anything else? Um, catching the window when they go into cycle. Okay. Yeah, or heat detection, and just being able to do that, and it's not uh, it's not always easy. But so the USDA did a survey in 2011, and they found that labor and time, just just trying to get people to you know, um, because. You know, with a traditional system, if you're just turning out a bull, it's just like whenever that date rolls around, like, oh, it's June 1st, it's time to turn out the bull, and we'll take him out in 80 days or whatever it is. Um, that That's pretty easy. There's not a lot of labor and time that goes into that, right? 
you're going to pay for that labor and time whenever it's calving season probably, but, but that's pretty easy. Um, but if you're going to do a synchronization protocol and you got to bring them in, like, um, like the young lady was saying about giving shots and, you know, just that, that it really restricts your time, I guess, for that, that week or seven day or five day protocol, whatever protocol you're actually using, um, you're, you're going to have to run them through the shoot, give them shots, put cedars in them, which, uh, I'll talk about a little bit later, but, um, or you're going to have to feed them a supplement or, or something like that to, to, you know, synchronize or get them ready to breed. Um, so there's a labor and time commitment that goes into that. And some, some people, like if you're a, a, you know, a rancher, you may not have the resources to pay somebody to do that, or your time might be better spent, you know, out irrigating, um, and, and doing something like that than, than it would, uh, you know, watching cows or giving shots to cows. So, um, and definitely with a, you know, a large herd, sometimes, um, sometimes there could be the argument that it's just, there's, we've got too many of them to, to deal with and don't have the time to, to, you know, to get them all, to breed them all. So there's that too. Um, and then there's the difficulty and complication part of it. Just, um, you know, it's, it, you, you got to learn how to do it. It's really important to have like people or, or trained technicians that are doing it. Uh, somebody that's, that's comfortable with it because it's not something you want to play around with. Uh, you know, if it's something that you're wanting to produce a, a good show animal or, uh, or if you're, if you're making a living off of it, um, it's important that, that we use, uh, you know, somebody who's good at it, somebody who's, um, done it a lot. And, and it's, it's really not that difficult of a process, but it does does take some time uh, to learn how to do it um, and and do it well. So people are you know nervous about that, and then also just the cost of it. You know, um, like I was saying before, it's kind of a toss up whether one is more than the other. Um, but uh, um, but there is an upfront cost, uh, you know, a lot of times, and, and especially you know, on the horse side of things, I can't, um, stress it enough. It seems like a lot of people want to breed their mares and, and have a baby horse out there, but they don't understand what the, uh, um, what the vet bills are going to be like just to get her bred and get all the ultrasounds done. And, um, you know, uh, you know, it's quite intensive. Um, and there's, there's a cost to that too. Um, uh, and then also just the lack of facilities, you know, some folks just, you know, don't have the facilities to run them through and give shots or run them through or, you know, get them into a corral and, and feed them for a long period of time. Um, so you've got to have the right facilities to, to handle your animals quite a bit. And then also there's just a belief, you know, some people don't believe that it actually works. They haven't been exposed to it. They've always done it the same way. You know, they've turned their bulls out or turn, you know, or, or bred the same way forever and it's worked for them and then they don't want to mess with it. So there's that too. But, um, so there's things that you got to consider, um, uh, before you AI, you got to consider what, what you're wanting to get out of it, what your goals are, how much labor you have available to work it. Do you have the facilities that we're talking about? Um, do I need to buy materials and equipment? Do I already have some of these things? Um, and, and do I have access to people that know how to do it or do I need to make go out and, and uh, learn how to do it myself? Um, you know, those are all really important things to know. And then also, and I have this condition of cattle, but it's really important in all animals. Um, reproductive success is directly related to um, the condition or just um, the fat, uh, you know, the, the fat resources that that animal has or the energy resources that that animal has. Um, so if they're thin, if you can see their ribs or or, uh, uh, you know, something like that, it's probably not worth the investment of uh, trying to AI or um, we really need to make sure that our animals, whether it's cattle or any, any animal, um, to make sure that they've got, you know, that they're on a good nutritional program, that, that we can feel fat over their ribs and over their top and, and, um, and that they've got plenty of protein and energy going into the breeding season and that they're on a good plane during, you know, breeding season and, and, you know, after breeding season, it's really important that, 
that we pay attention to the nutritional side of things because um, basically the body has a, a, a an order in which it, it covers its needs you know so like they're gonna, it's gonna use its energy reserves to, you know, cover basic needs such as breathing or, you know, I, you know, walking or, you know, just their maintenance requirements like that before they're gonna um, cover their requirements to um, cycle or uh, before they cover their requirements to grow a to grow a fetus. So if it's not if they're not in good condition if they're if their body isn't, um, you know, equipped to be pregnant, it won't be pregnant. So we really need to pay attention to their nutritional program before, during, and after um, an AI deal. Uh, I talked about that a little bit. So shifting gears a little bit, I wanted to talk a little bit about fresh semen versus frozen semen. This is, um, I say it in horses, but in other species too. Um, uh, especially with horses, uh, you know, it's, well, some sperm cells, um, sperm cells are they're, they're, they can be pr pretty sensitive to thawing and freezing process because um, I don't know it, what happens to um, water pipes whenever it's 20 below outside and we don't have the heat on in our house. What happens? They they break right because that water freezes and it expands. And now with certain cells, um, the same thing happens. So if we've got it, it's thawed and it freezes. And, you know, sometimes those membranes will, will um, you know, get destroyed just through the process of, of freezing and thawing. And, and some like cattle are more resistant um, and less sensitive to it. Um, than other species like horses. With horses, uh, almost all of the breeding is done with fresh semen. Um, and the, the, you know, the reason is, or well, the reason is, is because, you know, there's a lot more live viable cells. Now we can, we can still freeze those race horses that died, you know, a long time ago, but our conception rates with that frozen semen is gonna be a lot, a lot less. So if we really, really want to get our, our mare bred, um, you know, more often than not, we're going to be using live semen. One of the other things too, if we're going to be freezing semen, is that we can actually dilute, you know, some of those cells, like if we're talking about um, cattle or sheep or goats, um, we can take one collection and dilute it into a whole bunch of different units that can be used for a single breeding. Um, one of the disadvantages um, to uh, using live semen is that we can't, we, we don't typically do that, you know. Um, so, uh, and, and the other, uh, one of the big advantages of having frozen semen is that we can keep it in the tank until we need it, you know, until it's convenient to use. Whereas live semen, we've got to know when we're going to use it and it's got to be, you know, like shipped overnight and, and get there just in the nick of time, you know type of thing so um, there's lots of disadvantages to using fresh versus frozen semen and uh, um, yeah so that's it does anybody have any questions on that on, on how that works I don't feel like I covered that very yeah. a whole lot but it's kind of my take on that um, so I kind of wanted to go through now just some of the reproductive anatomy and physiology. Um, does, and seriously, if anybody has any questions on what I've covered so far, just stop me. But um, whenever I teach these classes, I, you know, whenever I teach an AI school, I always say the hardest part for me is, is, is actually helping somebody learn how to do it because whenever you're palpating or whenever you've got the, the the insemination rod in the animal you can't exactly see what you're doing well you can't see it at all um you've got a um you've got to get a feel for it um you've got to understand what the uh you know what the organs are and what they do and what they feel like and where you're supposed to be 
And, you know, if, if you don't, with cattle, I know for sure that you basically have a target area, which is the body of the uterus um, that you have to deposit that semen. And it's basically one inch by one inch spot in that cow. And, and you've got to be able to, to inseminate right in that spot. And you've got to, and that's just right, just past the cervix. So you've got to be able to be really confident in, in reaching in that animal and being able to feel where her cervix is and be able to pass that rod through the cervix and into that one inch body of the uterus and deposit the semen. So you really have to, you know, get a feel for it and practice and learn and memorize the functions of the, the anatomy. So during the first class of these AI schools, I really spent a lot of time going through the anatomy um, because it's, it's important and, you know, and understanding what we're doing. Um, and if we're not, uh, if we're not inseminating in the right spot or we're not uh, understanding the functions of these organs, uh, we're going to have decreased fertility and we're going to waste our time and money. So um, I, I try to paint a good mental picture of the parts that we're working with, how they work and, and how we, how we get there. So I throw this up and, and this is very similar for all animals. Um, there's a little bit of difference in uh, reproductive tract, but this one, um, you know, is of a cow. So whenever we AI uh, a cow or a heifer, we will palpate usually with our left hand um, rectally. Now there is a, so we, we reach into the rectum and there's a thin wall of tissue that separates the rectum from the reproductive tract. So we can actually, with our left hand, you know, we can feel the bottom, you know, we can push down on the bottom part of the rectum and we can feel that whole reproductive tract. And starting from the back and going forward, um, from the exterior of the animal, what you actually see in the exterior of the animal, that's called the vulva. Now, after you get through the vulva, there is about a, um, uh, you know, about an eight to 10 inch long um, uh, part. Uh, this is the vagina. It is a, it's a pretty, um, tough area um you know like the the vagina walls are pretty tough and pretty um you know elastic and um pretty hardy uh but then after you get to the end of the vagina there's uh there's another organ called the cervix and this is kind of the key organ whenever we're learning to ai this is what we're looking for this is what we're trying to develop a feel for when we palpate and this is because this is kind of the gateway between the exterior of the animal, even though it's, you know, in the interior, but it's, it's the gateway into the, the uterus where everything, you know, pregnancy happens. So, um, and the sperm cells have to get through the cervix to get into the uterus. Um, so right at the, the back end of the uterus or the back end of the cervix is where the body of the uterus begins. So. Um, and uh, so the body is right before it splits into two uterine horns. And then you can see the purple part. Those are actually the horns. They kind of look like horns and they curl around and end up at the ovary. Um, and there's a little shoelace type of thing uh, that, that connects the ovary to the uterine horns. And that in the oviduct is actually where fertilization occurs. Um, so the sperm cells have to swim all the way to that oviduct um, to meet up with the egg that's ovulated out of the ovary. So they've got to travel a long ways. Um, now, uh, another thing that I always mention too is that it's not necessarily part of the reproductive tract, but the bladder is right underneath it. So um, whenever we're artificially inseminating, we always have to be careful not to enter the bladder. And the way to do that is to just to um, exaggerate, uh, you know, trying to stay up on the, you know, with a 45 degree angle when you put that rod in there to stay out of the, stay out of the bladder. But that's kind of where it all sits. Now that's pretty similar for all animals. If we look at cervixes of their, or just uh, reproductive tracts of all animals, um, they're pretty similar for the most part. So if we're looking at, so here I've got uh, reproductive tracts of six different animals, um, and uh, they're all pretty similar. If you look at this one, this one is uh, a bar bipartite uh, uterus or bipartite reproductive tract. It has a single cervix, 
uh, uterine body. It has uh, smaller uterine horns, but it does, does have horns. And then there's that oviduct that connects to the ovary, which the ovary is the little pink part um, at the end. Uh, but if we look at uh, a mare, um, we see that uh, we've got a really a lot larger uterine body. So that target area is um, a lot bigger. Uh, but we've got a lot of a bigger uterine body. Um, we really don't hardly have any uterine horns. We've got little uterine horns, but long oviducts. Um, and if we look at a, a human, um, there's really no uterine horns. There's just a uterine body and oviducts. But um, uh, so that, that's kind of it. Now, the one that's not well, so we've got a, also a pig up here that's very similar. Um, to some of these, but one thing that's kind of unique about the pig is um, that they have, uh, it's kind of like a spiral type, corkscrew type uh, um, cervix, and the boar actually has a, the same um, shape of, of penis, so it, um, they, they're kind of unique in that aspect that whenever we're, we're breeding other, other animals, we don't have a specific end to the rod uh, but in, in pigs, we do. Um, so if you look at the blue spirette, um, basically you stick that into a, a sow and whenever she's receptive, um, it, you know, that corkscrew piece gets in there and the cervix will actually grab onto it. Um, so um, they're, they're pretty unique in that aspect and that makes them pretty easy to breed. Um, so whenever you can tell whenever, if you know, when you're heat detecting and you can tell when she's receptive, um, that's, you know, that's, that's a pretty good sign. We use uh, um, fresh semen uh, for pigs quite a bit too. Um, I don't need to go through that. Um, so this right here, I always talk about um, the ovaries. The ovaries are really, the ovaries are, are really what um, causes all the functions, whether, you know, whenever we do a synchronization protocol, whenever, whenever I say synchronization, that just means, again, we're causing all of the females to come into heat at a certain time. So if we want to breed everything on Saturday, we can synchronize to breed on Saturday. And basically what we're doing when we synchronize is we're manipulating the function of the ovary. So we're, we're, determining when she is going to ovulate from that ovary whenever she's going to release that uh, that egg out of the ovary so this picture right here I've got uh, on the top that is an actual ovary from a, a heifer calf and then down below that's what it looks like um, in an ultrasound now whenever she gets close to ovulating she has all the little black spots on there are follicles and those follicles all contain uh, uh, an egg that could be, you know, um, uh, ovulated, that, that, that could potentially result in a pregnancy. And um, whenever it's getting close to ovulating, it's going to get big and there'll be a dominant follicle. And it basically, it's like a big blister. It swells up and it pops and ovulates. And that it sends the egg down to meet up with the sperm where they, sperm fertilizes the egg but a really good indication of how fertile and how long we can expect a, a female to um, be reproductive is by the number of those follicles on her ovary so um, whenever I was in school I actually had a project where I was taking heifers and counting all of their follicles and and then looking at fertility and how long they're staying in the herd and and all those types of things um, but uh, the ovary, um, you know, is, is in charge of producing that egg. And within that uh, follicle is that little blister. Whenever it pops, it sends out a hormone that's estrogen and causes them to go into heat. So we can manipulate when that happens and when she comes into heat and, and when we breed her. So this, this whole thing... Um, just kind of shows the the whole brown thing is is kind of an over or is an ovary, and I was just going to explain basically the process of how it happens. It's just kind of interesting to me. You've got all those little follicles. That's where it starts in the bottom 
um, in the bottom left where it says start. It, you can see all of those little follicles that are on the ovary and then they grow and, and as they turn into a, you know, secondary and, and, and developing follicle, you can start to see this, this fluid buildup that happens. And then finally it gets big enough and ovulates and, and pushes that egg down to meet up with the sperm. Um, and then after that happens, you get a formation of uh, the, the corpus luteum. And corpus luteum is Latin. It means yellow body. And that yellow body, that CL on the ovary, it produces a hormone called progesterone. And progesterone um, maintains pregnancy. So whenever she's pregnant or whenever she's not cycling, she has a CL on her ovary that is producing a hormone that doesn't allow her to cycle. So if we put, um, if we use a, something like a cedar, which is like a, a vaginal insert in cattle, it's got a lot of progesterone on it. It keeps her from cycling. If we feed them um, MGA, which is similar to birth control in humans, whenever we take her off of that um, feed supplement, the, the, the level of progesterone goes down and it allows for other hormones like estrogen to go up and allows her to cycle. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, I'm going through a lot. Um, but the uh, estrus, so there's, a, there's the estrus cycle and there's multiple parts to the estrus cycle and I won't get in depth on those, but estrus, the estrus part of the estrus cycle um, is, is the heat part. That's when the female is receptive to breeding. The primary sign that she is receptive to breeding, if we're talking about cattle or pigs or sheep, I believe, um, is, is that they will stand and allow others to mount them. Now, with cattle, um, that's especially true if we've got a pen of heifers, they're gonna ride each other around and they'll stand there and let, let other heifers ride them until the, they you know, wear all the tear, tail, or all the hair off their tail head and they're raw from just letting their heifer mates do that. With sheep, um, they don't, that's not necessarily how that works. You really kind of need a, a ram in there to, to indicate when they're in heat. But pigs are very similar to cattle in that whenever a sow is ready to heat, she, she's gonna lock up and stand there and you can actually, people that are AI and pigs will just sit on their backs and they'll you know, let, them, let them do their thing. So whenever they're in standing heat, that is the primary sign. Um, and with, with mares, it's a little different. Obviously, if you have a, a stud horse around, um, he's gonna detect when she's ready, but the mares aren't gonna ride each other around um, like, like some of these other animals, but the vet's really gonna look at the follicle size. So whenever that, that dominant follicle that I was showing you back here, um, whenever that dominant follicle, like the, if you look at the, the ovary on the top left, um, you can see that one big follicle, it looks like a big blister. Whenever that reaches a certain size in horses, um, they know, and that size is 30 millimeters, whenever it reaches 30 millimeters, um, they know that she's gonna ovulate at any time. So they order that fresh semen to be shipped overnight because she's gonna, you know, she's gonna ovulate. So you really watch the follicle size on there. Now there's some, there's some secondary, so those are the important signs. Um, those are the ones that we're gonna look at when we're AI, but there's also some good secondary signs that we can look at across different species. Um, you know, uh, a real common one is just that the vulva, the exterior of the you know reproductive system, sometimes will will swell up or get like red or um, you know, like it'll just be toned up, and that's that that's a sign. Um, and it's not necessarily means that she's definitely in heat, but it's something that we notice. Sometimes you'll have uh, cattle that are pacing the pacing the the, the fence back and forth and they're mooing a whole lot. And what do you think they're doing? They're, they're looking for a bull, you know, they're trying to find a boyfriend. Um, so that's a, that's a secondary sign. Sometimes there'll be some rubbing, um, um, some sniffing and, and things like that too. There, there's, there's 
a lot of secondary signs uh, or there's um, uh, mucus on the tail head whenever they get into I'll talk a little bit about what happens um, whenever they're cycling but um, whenever sperm cells will swim against a current so if there's a if there is a, a current if mucus is coming out of the animal the sperm cells are going to swim against that current and go in um, so uh, if there is mucus on a tail head or something like that or there's some kind of discharge it could mean a number of things but usually if it's clear and it doesn't look like an infection um, that could be a sign of of uh, of heat so like I was saying um, this is an ultrasound of a, of a horse um, and whenever she reaches a good dominant follicle size she's gonna ovulate the timing of breeding is pretty important uh, or is, is really important um, we breed uh, with cattle she'll come into heat so she, she comes into heat at 7 a.m. in the morning and we see her standing and she's definitely in standing heat um, we'll breed her 12 hours later and the reason for that so so we, we see her standing at 7 a.m. we're gonna breed her at 7 p.m. and the reason for that is that even though she's standing she has she likely hasn't quite ovulated yet and we want those sperm cells we expect those sperm cells to live in the reproductive tract um, for uh, you know until that ovulation occurs. So just because she's standing doesn't mean that she's necessarily ovulated. It could mean she has, but um, whenever we dilute into smaller units of semen uh, or sperm cells, uh, we have to time that ovulation just right. So we wait actually until 12 hours after she's ovulated in cattle to breed. Um, uh, when, a, when a bull or a ram or, or you know a stallion is gonna, breed they're they're breeding on standing heat and they're breeding they're, they're depositing the semen not in the body of the uterus but in the vagina and that is just the the sperm cells have to travel a lot farther they've got to live a lot longer in the track um but whenever they deposit that one uh, that that one time they're they're depositing a lot more cells just a, a heck of a lot more cells than we are with one straw of semen so um they can get away with that, but you're probably not going to get away with it if we're just uh, AI. So we do wait 12 hours after for cattle. Um, it's always better to be early than late. I always say that, um, you know, somebody says, well, what if they come into heat at, at noon? What if they come into heat at lunchtime? But do I have to be out there at midnight to breed? Well, you know, uh, <laughs> some people would. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's always, you could always breed them at the end and it's, it's sometime at the end of your night breeding or whatever. So if you bred them the last thing before you went home at, at eight o'clock and you bred her at eight hours instead of 12, that's better than breeding her the next morning at 7 a.m. when you're, um, you know, at however many hours so you're at, you're at 19 hours, then you might be too late. So it's better to be too early and hope that those sperm cells live in the track and survive, then it is too late. And she's already started on our next cycle and is a good yet. So when we AI, um, there's, there's uh, a couple different ways. If we're talking about bigger animals like uh, cattle or horses, like I said, we're gonna, we're gonna palpate rectally, which means we reach in with our left hand and we insert the insemination rod with our right hand or the pipette with the right hand. Um, and, and some people are left-handed and they say, well, why would I, you know, could I palpate with the other hand? And, and we always encourage people to, to, to try to palpate with their left hand and, and, and inseminate with their right hand because they're, um, just the anatomy of the animal. Like if we're talking about, um, cattle, especially the rumen is on the left side. So if you're palpating with your left hand, it's just, it's, it's just a little bit easier to, the maneuver if you're on the same side whereas if you're on your right hand and it can get kind of tricky so um, most people always palpate with their left hand um, rectally and then and then inseminate with their right hand pigs are a little different you can see this guy on the upper right he's he's sitting kind of um, like he's riding this pig reverse kind of and then he is 
sticking that rod in there and and that sow uh she's in heat so it's got that spiral pipette on it it's latched onto it and he's depositing that fresh semen into um into that sow um so they're pretty easy and it's just kind of they're weird animals in, in that aspect i think they, they actually you know you don't have to like squeeze it or or push a plunger like you do with other animals it actually just sucks it out um so their their pigs are pretty dang easy um sheep are sheep and goats are a little tougher um they're they're similar reproductive systems to a cat the cattle but they're on a much smaller scale um so it becomes really hard to um you can't just palpate you know these things so there's a few different ways the, you know, uh, there's been some, a fair amount of uh, success, I think, with goats just, you know, um, you know, just, just going in uh, and not having to, not having to, well, so with sheep, there's the laparoscopy, that they're the laparoscopic way of, of artificial inseminating. Basically, that is, they'll sedate the, the ewe and, and turn her upside down, um, and uh, they'll, they'll go in with a microscope and they'll find the, you know, the uterine horn or, and, and, uh, you know, just stick a needle in there and, and, uh, inseminate that way. Um, but there's some risks that are involved with that. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely a little more invasive. Um, you know, there's, there's more chance of, of, uh, infection or some kind of th something happening to that animal. Um, and we've got a sedator, um, you know, things like that. Uh, but, but that can be pretty effective with lambs, um, or with, with sheep. And, and the other option is, is you can actually just, you know, inseminate vaginally, you know, and, and look, you know, and, and I've never seen this actually done, but, uh, you know, some goat people are having some luck with this. And, but the, the idea of it is whether you're, you know, you've got a technician that's doing sheep or goats, they've got to be really, well, with any animal, but especially with these, um, <laughs> they've really got to know what they're doing um, so that it's done right and you have a chance of success. Um, I don't, won't go over that. In cattle, uh, the, the estrus cycle is about 21 days, now, and it can range, that's an average. So every 21 days, she's going to cycle um, normally. And that can vary between 17 and 24 days. Um, it just depends on the animal. Sometimes heifers are a little sooner. Um, so sometimes heifers' estrus cycles might only be 19 days, whereas big, large, mature cows might be a little longer. And sometimes that has nothing to do with it. Some are just, you know, are longer than others. But an average is about 21 days. Um, I'll go too far into that. but. I wanted to go through so just the the whole process of of fertilization. Does anybody have any questions? Everybody still awake? I know it's getting late. I'll try to get through this last part. Okay. Um, so fertilization, like I said, occurs in the oviducts, um, and that is that little shoelace type organ that separates the ovary, where ovulation occurs. If you look at this picture, um, we can see the, the ovary is that that egg looking thing right there. And then we can see the top of that has a little hole and that's where the, the dominant follicle is and where I ovulated the egg. And then on the left side of that picture, you can see the uterine horn. And the, the oviduct is this where, you know, between the uterine horn and the ovary, and this is where the sperm cells and egg actually meet up. So this can take three to four days. Um, and there's a misconception of that whenever we breed that animal or whenever fertilization occurs that she's actually pregnant, that's not the case. Actually, um, so fertilization can occur and it usually takes, you know, about five days for um, that fertilized embryo to attach to the uterine wall. Um, and actually, you know, the, the body actually recognize that as pregnancy, maternal recognition of pregnancy that takes a few days. So, um, they're not instantly pregnant and we can get a fertilized egg without a pregnancy happening. 
Um, but that's, that's where fertilization occurs. So like I was saying before too, is that the uterine horn really aids in the transport of the semen. So whenever, or the sperm cells. So whenever we deposit the sperm cells, um, the uterine horns actually contract a little bit. And like I was saying, whenever they're, if you reach in or if, if you're palpating, you can tell when they're in good heat because their reproductive tract is like swollen. You can really feel a cervix, it's really hard. And then their uterine horns, you can really feel it good too because they're full of fluid. Um, they're, uh, they're ready to, to contract and help with the aid of that transport. Um, or you know, aid the transport of that those sperm cells. Um, so that's how it helps with that. And like I was saying, with the cervix, the cervix is the kind of the gateway between the vagina and the uterine body. And um, whenever she is in heat, that cervix, which is, you know, it's usually clinched. Whenever it's whenever she's pregnant or whenever she's not cycling, that thing is closed. It's protecting the uterine environment. Um, so if there's a, a baby growing in there, it's closed and it's not letting anything in or out. But whenever she comes into heat, it'll actually open up um, and allow for sperm to go through. So, um, but like I was saying with cattle, we're breeding 12 hours after we act, after she stands in heat. So we actually have to traverse that through that closed cervix, um, which is kind of tricky sometimes. Um, I don't know how they do it in, in sheep, um, but uh, in cattle, I know that you know, the, the body of the uterine body is where you deposit the, uh, the semen. And the reason for that is the uterine body is right before it, it bifurcates into two, two uterine horns. It turns into two uterine horns. Uh, there's two ovaries and there's two possible places where that ovulation could occur, but we don't know exactly where it's going to occur. So if we accidentally put it in the left uterine horn and she ovulates on the right, we're not going to get her pregnant. So we deposit that semen right before um, that that split happens, so that the sperm cells can go either direction. And that's where they found is the most, um, you know, the the best chance of getting her pregnant. So, like I was saying, whenever we're palpating, we're looking for the cervix. Um, we're going to reach in and find, uh, um, it's kind of like a chicken neck structure. We can, we can reach down and feel that. Um, it's really important that if we're putting anything in the animals, uh, whether we're inserting a insemination rod or uh, whatever, that, that we aren't pushing foreign material through the cervix and into the uterus because that could cause infections or, or non-pregnancies. So, um, the way that we insert the rod um, is important and, and just being really clean is important no matter what, what species you're dealing with. Talked about that. And this, this picture kind of illustrates what it's like to pass the rod through the cervix. Um, so the cervix has kind of these rings in it and, and you have to reach, you have to grab it with your palpating hand and and manipulate it um, so that you can get that that rod all the way through. And on the right side of the picture, that's the body of the uterus. So you'll be able to feel the rod inside the animal at all times, with the exception of whenever it's in that cervix, that tough tissue. You won't be able to feel it there, um, and you just have to try to get it through without being able to feel it. So it's kind of tricky. And this is the part where you get through the cervix and you get it just barely, barely past the cervix and into the body of the uterus. And we can feel that rod again and, and we can deposit the semen. So that's, that's kind of how it works. Now with, with if we're gonna do a laparoscopic AI, we're actually just gonna stick a, a you know, we're gonna go through with a, you know, a microscope and look where we're going and we're gonna stick a needle through the wall of that, uh, that uterine body. Um, which is really pretty delicate tissue. Um, and if it's done really clean and, and good, uh, you know, they're pretty, um, they heal pretty good. Um, and, but we can, we can get good success that way too. But it's the same way. It's basically the same system. Um, but instead of going in vaginally, we're actually, we're actually going in um, with a needle. So 
that's it. Uh, this just kind of shows, you know, where where you want to deposit um, on this top one. You can see this, the bifurcation uh, where you got the two uterine horns. And if you deposit where you're supposed to, you can see that those the, the sperm can swim in up each different horn. Uh, if you don't get far enough and you deposit in the cervix, we can see that those sperm cells kind of, that's the semen gets stuck in the cervix and isn't gonna get to the site of fertilization, so we're not gonna do any good. And in the bottom one, you can see this is also an incorrect technique because we're up in the left horn. And if we deposit there, sperm cells are gonna go up the left horn, but if she ovulates off the right side, then we're not gonna get her pregnant. So the best spot to, to get you know, them bred is in the body of the uterus. And that's, that's basically all I've got. Um, and I don't know what I forgot to cover. I know this is such a, we spend, um, you know, most of a whole week going over this kind of, this kind of stuff. And, and I, it's kind of hard to condense it down into, um, into this and, and cover multiple species. So I want to hear what you guys have for questions and maybe what I didn't cover. And, um, yeah. What's the ideal sperm count per straw? The I, the ideal, say that again, sperm count? Yeah, per straw. That's a good question. I, I honestly, I don't know. Um, you know, there's a difference in species too. I, I suppose you're probably talking about cattle, right? Yeah. Yeah, cattle. Um, I don't, I don't have any idea, but that varies a lot. Um, and that's something too that um, uh, certain sires are going to have a high sperm count, and certain sires are going to are not going to have a high sperm count. Um, and and the way they handle the semen is they can they can control the number of um, sperm cells that are going into one unit of semen. So I, and I don't know what that number is. What's standard for that? Um, however many millions of cells that is. Um, but sometimes if you look in sire catalogs, like I know um, we use like sire stuff for, you know, for our images and in, in some of our um, classes, but they actually, if you look in their sire, sire catalog, they have certain sires that say are, um, I can't remember how they put it, but they're, they're, good settlers or something like that. They've got some kind of certified settlers or certified breeder or something like that. And usually that means that either one, that bull produces more sperm compared to his peers, more sperm cells, or they didn't dilute it as much so that there's more, more cells in that unit compared to the other one. So you might keep an eye out for that whenever you're, you're picking, but uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer to the number. Okay, thank you. That was a good question. Any other questions for chance? Anybody have any course questions or sheep questions that I might not be able to answer? But I hear they're they're AIing a, a chicken somehow. I, I haven't <laughs> I haven't been uh, I haven't heard anything or I haven't seen anything about how that works or anything. That's kind of interesting. I know they do it in dogs too or something, but um, I haven't been around that at all. That's really cool to see, to see that technology has moved it forward though to the chicken world. That's really cool. Yeah, another thing too that, that, it's, um, that it's done and I think will become more uh, um, mainstream in the future uh, I talk about quite a bit, or we get questions about quite a bit, is sex semen. Um, and sex semen is just, uh, you know, you can, you can get, uh, you know, a unit of semen that has only male cells or only female cells. And there can be advantages to that. And in the dairy industry, it's really widely used um, because there's really no value to a dairy bull calf. Right there's there's lots of value to good heifer calves because they're producing milk. Or that's that's their function. So they want all heifer calves. So they're really breeding heavily um, for for those, and they're they're 
using sex semen um, to just get heifer calves. So that's kind of interesting. Or, or there's also some, you know, purebred black Angus, you know, the seed stock black Angus folks that are producing and selling bulls, you know, trying to produce the next awesome bull that's going to help, you know, uh, ranchers. So they're selling all male semen, male sorted semen. Kind of how the process works is that um, they can take a collection of sperm cells and basically there's a difference in size of chromosomes. So uh, X chromosomes are a little bit bigger. They're like three, per three to four percent bigger than Y chromosomes. So if you have a sperm cell that has two X chromosomes, a female, it's, it's a little bit bigger uh, than a y, uh, an XY um, male sperm cell. So whenever you, it, you can put some fluorescent dye into that and it'll, it'll soak up that dye and then it'll put a charge on there. And then there's a machine that'll send each cell through their single file. It'll measure the charge of that, of that sperm cell, the, the, the amount of fluorescent, the size of that cell, and it'll sort the big ones into the X pile and the smaller ones into the Y pile. And that's kind of how sex semen works. I think it's gonna be a, a bigger, it's a big deal in the dairy industry. Um, and we're seeing it some in the seed stock industry of the beef of, of beef industry. But I think it's gonna be more and more used, um, you know, in the future. There's ways that we can, you know, uh, steer calves make more money for a commercial producer than a heifer calf. So maybe we can produce whole loads of steer calves. Or maybe we can produce, or maybe we could target breed where we get, um, uh, we breed a certain amount of our cows to produce our replacement heifers and the rest go to a terminal cross that produce steer calves and make us more money. We get the replacement heifers out of our elite cows, you know. But I think that there's some target breeding um, applications for sex semen in the future. So I think there's, there's still room for this technology to grow, for sure. That's really cool. That would be a good lab to do is to, to be able to do a lab around that. So other questions for Chance? Anybody else? Chance, so I have a question. I'm just curious if you know the answer is, is that so PG600 is one of those synchronizing drugs that are has been used heavily in the swine industry. And I don't know if you know it's off the market. Do you, and so I'm wondering, do you know much about that or what they're going to replace it with? Or You know, I don't. Um... So PG 600, that is a, um, it's a prostaglandin. Um, so basically when we're synchronizing animals, we have three hormones that we work with to, to manipulate the estrous cycle. We have progesterone, which I talked about, which is like birth control that maintains pregnancy or doesn't allow for um, heat to happen. So that's one. And then we've got um, GNRH, which is just a shot that we can give to cause them to ovulate if they haven't already. We can kind of reset them. And then the one that, that Don's talking about is the, the PG. Um, the PG is prostaglandin, and that is the, the hormone that's sent from the uterus to kill the CL that produces progesterone or prost uh, progesterone. Um, and it kills the CL and allows for heat to happen. So um, that, that hormone in cattle is lutealized. Um, and, uh, so I, I don't know, I don't know what the different, I don't, I haven't bred many pigs, <laughs> so I don't know what the, I don't know what the status of that is, but that's kind of how those work, those hormones work. Very good. Thanks. I just know that that's the other drug that, um, they use a lot in the goat and the sheep as well. And so it's kind of a, I think a challenge out there. So anyways, but sure. all right, guys, any other questions from anybody? All right, I'm going to stop recording here. Let me just.